Nick Maupin was a corporal in the United States Marine Corps. He graduated from Britwood High School in 2003 and was inspired to join the Marines after the events that occurred September 11th. I remember being in class and it was in between a break where we saw it on the TV and, and I actually saw the second plane hit the towers. It was kind of a call to arms at that time and, and I was one of the ones that joined after that. With a mechanical background, Nick decided to work on tanks for his position. He was deployed to a base in Fallujah, Iraq for seven months. I, I got woken up really early one day and we drove, I think, 11 hours in a tank that's driving 35 miles an hour to go pull out um, four LAVs. Nick had many responsibilities during his deployment in Iraq. Our job was to make a road that was closed at the time open to, to military traffic for military convoys. During his time in service, Nick learned the importance of camaraderie while overcoming various obstacles. So every once in a while we'd have to clean the squad bay, which is this huge open room with a bunch of racks in it, or beds in it. And we actually put water um, four inches deep and we had to keep the water on one side of the line with just using a brush. And so there's a hundred of us just pushing back water with a brush that was four inches deep. So when you think about it, the could one person do that? Absolutely not. But a, a team of people that were working towards the same goal can, can achieve a lot. Nick learned valuable life lessons from his time in the military. They would help shape the man and father he is today. Military teaches you a lot of things, uh, but the military also teaches you that with enough willpower and enough manpower, you can move whatever you want to do. Anna Espenshade, WBHS9. Johnny Patchett, a former veteran, is able to reminisce his past experience in the military. I joined the Air National Guard, I think it was 1962. I was inactive, I was not on a war field or anything like that, but actually had uh, a really good job. I was in charge of the fuel. Although Johnny had an easy job, there were still stressful situations that he had to endure. When I was guarding the barracks in uh, Amarillo, Texas, all of a sudden we heard planes leaving the, the ground at, there at the base. And we didn't know what in the world was happening. And then we got announcements that we needed to take cover until all the planes are off the ground because the President of the United States had been shot in Dallas, Texas. While there were alarming times at the base, Johnny still had his friends to fall back on. This is a picture of our group at the Air Force Base in Amarillo, Texas. And that was in November of 1963. This is me right in the center. Uh, we had a good relationship with everybody. The facility was a little bit different. Johnny was not the first in his family to serve in the military. He had one before him to show him the importance of protecting his country. My dad was in the army, and he was actually <clears throat> shot in the Battle of the Bulge during World War II. He was hurt real bad, and he survived, and he came home, uh, and we were very proud of him. I've still got the flag that we had at his funeral that was uh, sent, given to him when he got out of the military. Luckily, for the most part, Johnny had a calm experience in the military and made it safely back home to his family. Since then, he has been able to pursue his love for Jesus, spend quality time with his family, and take part in his favorite hobby, painting rocks. David Ward, WBHS 9. Meet Thomas Andrews, a veteran whose dedication to service spans decades. Today, we had the privilege of sitting down with him to dive into the remarkable chapters of his career. Uh, I was in the United States Air Force for f about four and a half, five years, and then I joined the Pennsylvania Air National Guard. I finished as a lieutenant colonel, then I got an honorary bird colonel appointment. And then uh, I was stationed in Bangor, Maine 
for a while, a place called Dow Air Force Base, which is now closed. <clears throat> but then I served in Thule, Greenland, uh, flying refueling tankers. For Thomas, Greenland was more than a duty station. It was a defining experience. Well, the, the Cold War was pretty hot then with Russia. And um, <clears throat> our job was to uh, fly refueling missions over the North Atlantic Ocean out of Greenland. But SAC required that all flag crews practice different kinds of alerts. So there were three kinds of alerts. There was like yellow, amber, and red. And yellow was just practice, get ready for war, but there's no war. Amber is maybe, there is, but get more practice. And red, we're at war. Now the ocean is frozen over, and it's not smooth like a nice lake, it's like this. And uh, our, uh, no one knew whether the aircraft would get off the ground because of the fuel load. Yeah, that was a bad day for some of my friends. I keep saying, is the red alert still on? Yes, still on, still on. Clear for takeoff. Two of my friends, two pilots, and there were three other crew members. They take off, get airborne a little bit, settle down, crash on the ocean. It's all filled with jet fuel and aviation gas. Blows up. It's all, everything is scorching. Do a Pete McNeil. He's in, still living. He's in Arkansas. And uh, he gets off okay. He lumbers down, almost gets down there, and he finally gets up. So I thought, well, it's my turn. <clears throat> so I get up. They say, you're clear for takeoff. Run the engines up. And then I hear, disregard, abort, abort, abort. Pull it, and they crawl it back. They call the alert off. Now, someone made a mistake. There was some miscommunication at some higher level of decision making. Thomas Andrews retired in 1982. Thank you, Thomas, for your service. Carrie Summers, WBHS 9. This is Richard Price, the son of a World War II veteran who tells the story of his father, Robert Price. Robert graduated from the University of Illinois, where he then went to officer candidate school and then flight school in Pensacola. Following graduation, he became a liaison for the Royal Air Force. Uh, his name was Robert Hoyt Price. He f flew an F, the Grumman F-7 Hellcat. W when, when Dad got back from his, his deal with the RAF, he was assigned to uh, the USS Calpins, CVL-25, uh, out of California. And he was on that plane, and there were fighting the Japanese off Saipan, and he got shot down. And he uh, safely ended up in the water, and a friend of his saw it happen and threw his life raft overboard, along with a note and a bottle of water It says, we'll, we'll be coming back to get you, Bob. Robert was recovered after 11 days at sea. He lost 50 pounds, was extremely sunburnt, but all the less, he was in good spirits. Anyway, he went back. Uh, Back to the, back to the war, and was on the uh, Calpins, also called the Mighty Moo, and Typhoon Cobra hit. It was a devastating typhoon, and one of the uh, aircraft aboard the Calpins caught on fire, and Dad was trying to cut it loose so it would go overboard and not catch any of the other planes on fire and he went over with it, and that was the last anybody had ever seen of him. Richard now spends his time with family, and he also plays the saxophone in the public orchestra. Henry Bradley, WBHS 9. My name's Terry George, married, um, been married 24 years, 60 years old, didn't get married until I was 36, busy all my younger years with the military, and uh, living that life. Born in Nashville, moved around a lot. My dad was in the Marines, but then we ended up back in Nashville. Uh, in college, I went under Army ROTC, but then later on, because I wanted to be a pilot and I learned that the Army didn't have a lot of opportunity for pilots, they do have pilots in the Army, I transferred over in the Air Force and became a pilot in the Air Force. 
I got an academic scholarship for ROTC. I started fall of 1984 and graduated in May of 1987, which is when I got commissioned. Then a year later in 88, I went to flight school for the Air Force, and that's a year long school, finished it in May of 89, and then remained in the Air Force for 29 total years and graduated as Lieutenant Colonel in May of 2016. I always knew I wanted to be in the military, and I almost joined the Air Force straight out of high school, but then, you know, went to college instead, and just felt like it was the right thing to do. Like, it just always seemed like the thing I was gonna do all my life. Where did you go in combat? Um, I was in Bosnia for that war, and then I went to the first desert war, and I stayed in Saudi Arabia for that one. And then the second desert war, I was in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, and Oman, and Kuwait and Iraq. One of the cool things I got to do is fly special forces and we would drop them out at different austere locations. And a neat thing about them is they would jump off the back of the airplane versus the normal paratroopers jump out the side doors. It was while I was flying uh, C-130s. And part of my career, I flew C-130s in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, I actually have a picture of flying over Nashville and it was neat since that's where I was born to go over my hometown and got to do that several times. When I retired, I was actually flying drones. And that was probably the most interesting thing was, you know, being in Nashville, but flying a uh, airplane that was overseas in one of those battle areas, you, you're not allowed to talk about it. But just to fly that and the technology and all the secret stuff that thing could do and the capabilities, and I mean, it carried missiles and bombs and just, it was, and it was just really phenomenal, the, the things you could do with that versus just flying an airplane. Favorite thing and the best thing I ever did in the Air Force was my last month before I retired, I got baptized at the military base with all my uh, fellow guys that I'd served with. Where do you work now? I'm a pilot with the airlines, American Airlines, I fly 777, they call it 777, and I do uh, Europe, usually I do London, and um, actually next week I'm flying to London, and this week I'm, uh, I'm off on vacation right now. What are your current hobbies? Just be active. So today I was water skiing in November, which is phenomenal. I just got back yesterday from a dirt bike trip, my dirt bike's sitting over there. I have a mountain bike, I surf. I used to fly to Miami with the airlines and surf there, and I surf behind the boat, and we wake foil. And, uh, and we snowboard. So yeah, very active lifestyle. You know, I mean, I was in it 29 years, so really it was my entire adult life in a way. And you really, you have a camaraderie and you know, everybody, you have each other's back. And like now I have a job and honestly, it pays twice as much money. And I'd go back, you know, with these wars going on, if they said, hey, we'll take old guys, I'd go back in a second. I wouldn't even hesitate. And thank you to our veterans for their service. Logan Kirchville, WBHS9. Mr. Roberto Marrero has been teaching physics and chemistry at Brownwood High School for 17 years. Previously in his life, he served in the Army and was involved on a number of missions, including the Vietnam War. Mr. Marrero served for a total of 40 years, and he mentions how his experience in the military helped shape his past. Service uh, redirected me uh, as a young man. I was uh, not very focused on the important things in life, and I think the military gave me a structure in my first three years of uh, military service. That structure helped me uh, get myself through college, establish a family, and actually became, become a professional. Throughout my military career, service helped me uh, hone my leadership skills, and I was able to exercise the, those in other spheres in, in, uh, in my life. The last latter phase of my career was in preparing uh, soldiers, I was brigade commander for deployment after 9-11. I served uh, twice in active duty uh, in uh, 2003 in charge of Operation Guardian Mariner, which deployed soldiers uh, 
on U.S. ship merchant ships uh, throughout the uh, world, protecting them uh, from primarily from terrorist attacks. Other things that are interesting, I can't talk about. After leaving the military, Mr. Marrero now lives in Brentwood, Tennessee with his family. He's a teacher at Brentwood High School, sponsors the robotics club, and he plays his guitar during lunch. Maria Porvese, WBHS 9. Scott is a former nuclear power plant officer that served from 1982 to 1997. So I was uh, served in the United States Navy, uh, active duty from 1987 to 1992. Uh, and I was a nuclear power officer within the United States Navy. I started uh, my career in the Navy as a Navy ROTC uh, candidate and, and student at uh, Vanderbilt University. And when I graduated, I was commissioned an officer in the Navy. Scott Yates served in the first Persian Gulf War. He was stationed in Washington, D.C., although some of his classmates were deployed. A nuclear power officer in, in the late 80s. Uh, for the history buffs, uh, that was uh, the you know, at the, the end of the Cold War. So while I was on active duty, you know, the Berlin Wall came down and uh, there were a lot of changes and the threats that we've been facing uh, in the world um, since then have been not uh, as much global uh, conflict with superpowers, but uh, very small conflicts around the, around the globe. So. During probably the most interesting piece is during my time, we did a lot of changing of what our priorities were. We weren't just uh, fighting the, the war of deterrence and to try to prevent war with, uh, with Russia, but thinking about uh, how do you protect and uh, keep the peace around the world uh, with a lot of smaller conflicts. And as seen by the, the first Persian Gulf conflict um, during my time. Scott Yates spends most of his free time with his family including fishing, hunting, and traveling with his wife. Almost all of the technical things that I dealt with uh, were confidential and secret. So uh, it was, it, I could not talk about what I did. Uh, I could talk in general what I did, but I couldn't tell anything specific. I couldn't bring any work home. At the end of the day, uh, things were all locked up. Even our desks were cleaned and in safes. Samuel Yates is a Brown High School student, and we got some extra intel on what it's like to live with a war veteran. But my dad, he's not really like too hard on you about a bunch of things. Good standards, yeah. Hardworking. I think the Navy taught him that, especially from his grandfather. So, yeah. They talk about the military being a brotherhood, and it really is, but not just a brotherhood of who you served with uh, in close proximity, but who you, you, we really feel the, the family sense of it, of everyone who served across all branches. I'm John Jackson, WBSS 9. This is David Gustafson, an ex-Navy officer. When asked about why he chose the Navy, he claimed it was because of a movie. Top Gun came out, wow, that was cool. Flying jets, fighting the Russians, Top Gun was just amazing. And those guys look so sharp in their uniform, so. I always thought about joining the military, but as soon as I saw Top Gun, I was completely motivated to try the Navy. Yeah, I joined the Navy through the ROTC programs. The ROTC program was the Reserve Officer Training Corps, and that gives you a chance to go to college full-time and really learn to become a member of the Armed Forces. And then this is a picture. It's black and white, but it doesn't mean that it's that old. Now, this is from 1996, but uh, it's the wardroom or the officers that were in the CB battalion when I served, and so I'm right here. Yeah, so some of my, my favorite things to do in the Navy was to work with other people, and uh, my second uh, job in the Navy was to be a company commander in the CB battalion. So a CB battalion's got about 500 troops, sailors in this case, and we called ourselves CBs because we were the construction battalion, so our job was to go out and build things for the Navy in a forward deployed manner. Yeah, I think there's you know, there, there's definitely value in, in finding ways to, you know, make yourself useful. And um, it's really important to, you know, always contribute when you're a member of a team. And, you know, a lot of the military can be, experience can be transferred into the business world and into your personal life you know, through being a good teammate. And, you know, really think about how you can help 
Uh, never think about yourself. Always think about what's the best, you know, the best interests of the group. Keep those in mind. And, you know, use those things to motivate you. And then, you know, kind of be open and be vulnerable to other people and really build relationships. Those are really important when things get, you know, really get tough. Uh, but those people will be there for you when things get tough for you. So, you know, for me, it's really about coming in every day and trying your best and you know, continuing to, to challenge yourself and in a way challenge the group to achieve more and great things. After he got out of ROTC, he served in the Navy for six years. Next Castile, WBHS 9. This Veterans Day, retired Lieutenant Colonel Damian Calvert was able to elaborate on his military service. My name's uh, Damian Calvert, and in the military, I served in the, the Army, uh, and I was in aviation. And then within aviation, in the Army specifically, you have uh, officers and warrant officers, and so I was an officer uh, within uh, Army aviation. So I served for 20 years. Uh, I started in flight school in Dothan, Alabama, uh, where they taught us how to fly helicopters, so I learned to, to fly helicopters there. So I flew, uh, you, you get a chance to fly multiples, but the, the, the main uh, two that I flew were Blackhawks and uh, Chinooks. So when I was in uh, what you would consider the conventional army, I flew uh, Blackhawks. And then I transitioned from conventional into the Special Operations uh, Aviation Regiment. And that's where I learned how to fly Chinooks. Um, so you have uh, different variants. So the variant that I flew in the Blackhawk was the was the Alpha Charlie, and then um, I believe I got to fly the Mike model too. And then in the Chinook, uh, I got to fly what they call the 47G, uh, so the Golf, uh, the Golf model. When asked about his last job in the military at Fort Campbell, this is what he had to say. Because I decided to retire, they they put me on a special project. So that was my last job at Fort Campbell, and that was working on. Um, soldier suicide. So just trying to figure out how we could provide the necessary resources uh, to, to slow that down. So I served as that suicide uh, director. And so they called it uh, People First. So really it was just focused on bringing the necessary re resources together to help people um, just find help uh, ultimately. And then hopefully they call it a chain of events, but to really break the chain of events for you to decide to, uh, to commit suicide. So I worked on that as a special project, so that was really neat. If you are or know a veteran or active military member that struggles with suicide, go to this website. Hank Strange, WBHS 9.